Thanks very much. Um, I'd like to begin with a thank you to you all for being here and for being awake this far after lunch and this close to dinner. Thank you for that. Um, I'd like to thank uh, Dr. Chris Held, who's the president-elect, who asked me to speak today, and Dr. Marilyn uh, Singleton, the president of AAPS, who's just done a bang-up job all year with uh, writing, publications, and, uh, and media work. Thank you. And of course, I'd like to thank uh, uh, the mother of all of this, uh, Dr. Jane Orient, who's the um, executive director of AAPS. And uh, briefly, I wanted to dedicate my lecture today to uh, someone whose name is Dr. Z. Um, Dr. Marcy Zwelling, who was a family physician uh, who will be present tomorrow night and I believe uh, will be getting a Silver Scalpel Award from uh, AAPS, which is their highest honor. She established the NPCHCP, the National Physicians Council for Healthcare Policy, with Congressman Pete Sessions of Texas, where we met, uh, gosh, there must have been 150 of us that met in Washington, D.C. for years, every six months, talking about policy changes and trying to affect positive change for patients and physicians. So um, I wanted to just dedicate this lecture to uh, Dr. Z. And there's a picture of the uh, NPC HCP with uh, Dr. Zwelling uh, in the center in orange. So we're going to talk a little bit about hospitals today because it's amazing um, how they started and uh, where they are today. Having said all of that, the first hospital was founded in Philadelphia prior to the uh, country's founding, actually, uh, in 1751. Uh, 25 years before uh, the, uh, the War for Independence. It was, the hospital was uh, founded as Pennsylvania Hospital by a Thomas Bond, who was an MD-trained physician, and Benjamin Franklin, who was a uh, businessman, philanthropist, writer, and what, what didn't Ben Franklin do? The idea behind all of this was to take care of the sick poor and the insane wandering the streets of Philadelphia. And that was the original stated goal. One could make an argument as to whether it's still the case today, um, if you're looking at the political strata anyway. Uh, take care of him and I will repay thee. It went by the Good Samaritan image. Um, the hospital had to take all comers to earn its tax-exempt status. And this was based on the Elizabethan Statute of Char Charitable Uses of 1601 that bestowed exemptions upon hospitals and charitable organizations to promote the common welfare. So as we started to talk about uh, during lunch with uh, Dr. G. Key Smith, that uh, it was progressive legislation over years that provided funds. Uh, in 1942, there was the War Powers Act, the Stabilization Act, and the Revenue Act that froze wages because we were involved in uh, World War II. However, it did allow for untaxed benefits. So if anybody wonders whose genius idea and uh, encouragement was required to establish workplace employer-sponsored benefits, it was the federal government. And we saw where that led us decades later. In 1943, um, the IRS made a directive to continue it. And uh, he also um, referred to, in 1946, the Hill-Burton Act, where the government provided subsidies to establish hospitals. Now, this was a one-time grant, actually, to establish hospitals. And you know what uh, Ronald Reagan said about that, that uh, the longest living thing is uh, a short-term uh, government program, for sure, and it's uh, been in perpetuity. Uh, the tax code was updated in 1954 to preserve this exemption. In 1965, uh, the government created a spigot of dollars for, uh, for hospitals called Medicare and Medicaid. We all know that Medicare uh, was originally established uh, and if you look at the way it was constructed, it was sort of a Ponzi scheme. It was to take all of the people working and to pay for the health care of those who were lived to retirement age, where very few people did. Um, unlike, unlike today, the ratio has changed completely. And Medicaid, of course, was to take care of the, the unfortunates uh, and, and folks who were uh, unemployed and what have you. It was a fundamentally state program and since, in decades since, the Fed has kind of usurped the control of that. Uh, in 1969, there was a revenue ruling uh, that created a community benefit standard and it removed the requirement that nonprofit hospitals provide uh, care at their own cost or, or lower than their cost or free care in order to keep that tax designation. So now, as you know, hospitals don't pay taxes, but you know, you as physicians, and your offices certainly do. 
1973, the deluge continued with the HMO Act of Richard Milhouse Nixon. It was a, it was a set a standard for, um, for a health maintenance organization that had never been tried. And, uh, and unfortunately, those of us that, that survived that, both as patients and physicians and business owners, into the 90s when HMOs all but exploded, <coughs> literally and figuratively. Uh, in 1986, there was an unfunded mandate called MTALA, which I'm sure you're familiar with, that said emergency departments must see all patients regardless of pay status, which was interesting because if any of you trained in the 80s and 90s as I did, anytime someone was in the ER and in their pay slot on the forms, it said self-pay, it was the un understood thing at the time that the hospital wasn't going to get paid on that. And the reality was they were going to use it to write off their taxes so that their high costs could be subsidized by taxpayer monies. Government regulations again compounded the problems. Hospitals ex were still exempt from uh, not only taxes but the Federal Trade Commission they were exempted from their jurisdiction, so the FTC didn't even control what was going on with hospitals, which is a, a big business problem for sure. Medicare Part A was hospital, Medicare Part B was physicians, and the total bills kept getting inflated because original Medicare paid a percentage of, of what the care actually uh, was purported to cost, and nobody wanted to collect from patients, and patients were harder to collect from. So what hospitals did and other entities is they just raised the total costs. And they first raised them in a linear fashion and then raised them exponentially. And then later, Medicare decided that there was uh, to be some tables and things that they could harness uh, to establish reasonable and customary fees. And I still don't know what reasonable means or customary means, uh, despite all of my research for this talk. Medicare pro, uh, Medicaid programs, I should say, were progressively ruled by CMS, as we mentioned. Um, poor reimbursement wasn't sustainable for private practices. Hospitals still remained taking it, but they were writing off all of their losses so that they could cry poor mouth and build buildings in their parking lots and something I never quite understood, the duality of that, crying poor mouth and buying buildings. Having said all that, I'm, I'm gonna take a second to do a shameless plug for uh, Dr. Ken Fisher's book uh, on the history of uh, healthcare. If uh, anybody has interest in some of the underpinnings of this lecture, uh, check that out. And more and more and more legislation and regulation. In 1987, the GPO Purchasing Safe Harbor was established to exempt the middlemen from the anti-kickback laws. And we'll also see how that plays out later on in the 2000s. Nobody is in business in the, in the country is allowed to ask for kickbacks or rebates or whatever you want to call them because it, it's illegal. You can't do it. However, they have uh, an anti-kickback uh, statute where they're allowed to, to skirt that issue, the general purchasing organizations. Um, in 1996, we all know HIPAA. Um, everybody thinks of it as the Privacy Act, but as Twyla Brace RN, who has spoken uh, on this stage many times, um, has told us, it's it's not the Privacy Act, it's the Anti-Privacy Act because it exempts government, insurance industry, and their designees from private penalties on these issues. In 2002, the HHS, Office of the Inspector General, expanded and included PBMs in the GPO safe harbor. So guess what? Companies like Caremark, Express Scripts, things like that, that were middle guys that were supposed to bring down costs, but we all know the reality of that. They raised costs exponentially. They extorted the manufacturer for what they called rebates, which I call kickbacks, because I like to call things what they are. Uh, and the manufacturers then got a bad rap for raising the prices. So unfortunately, one of the big issues that the public needs to know about is the PBM safe harbor. And we've been fighting in, in DC for many years now to get that um, protection for them removed. Because we know companies like Caremark got larger, bought CVS, one of the larger pharmacy chains, and then bought Aetna, an insurance company, which has total integration, and I thought for sure it would be struck down by the federal government, but uh, it, it passed somehow, and I, I still want to meet the people who, uh, who got it passed. In uh, 2005, 
Uh, a, uh, a nurse came to my door named Hetty Weinstein. She said, I'm from the state and I'm here to help you. And uh, it was a bit of a concern. The federal government had established a program to get everybody on electronic health records. And you all know I've spoken on this stage multiple times about the travesty as it unfolded of electronic health records. These billing systems that were, were forced upon all of medicine with, without any kind of clinical trials, which is crazy to us as physicians and clinicians. But having said all of that, um, the Fed gave money to the states to establish contractors to come to our office to see that we were all ready to accept the new reality of electronic health records. And uh, after she spent several hours in our office, she came to us and she said, you know, you have the tightest paper practice that I've ever seen. You guys don't miss a trick. Charts don't get lost. They don't go missing. Nobody uh, gets any information they shouldn't have. Things run very well, but I'm proud to tell you that you're 100% ready for a whole nother untested system called electronic health records. Congratulations on your A+. And then a few months later from the state, I, I got a certificate saying I was officially ready to ruin my practice with the HR. <laughs> Having said all of that, there was the ARA High Tech Act, as, as we were saying, that then coerced physicians and hospitals to adopt EHR for Medicare and Medicaid. They promised you a big pot of money. And again, I've spoken about this several times and published about it in medical economics and several other periodicals. And you all know what kind of a tragedy it is when the government offers you money to do something, then they make up a bunch of... Uh, issues and things for you to climb through a bunch of red tape. And then the interesting thing is, when the whole system fails, four years later, they come after you to produce the data again four years later when you're using a different system, and they say, we want all the money back then. And it's, it's a nightmare to get a letter from the IRS and from the Treasury saying, you owe us X teen thousand dollars, and do you want to pay it right now or through the nose? That's a really, really um, terrible thing to have happen. Having said all of that, there's, in 2011, the HHS, uh, Office of the Inspector General, allowed uh, the anti-start kickback waivers practices for ACOs, which were established by the, uh, what I call the Unaffordable Careless Act, because it was both unaffordable and careless, and the last speaker uh, spoke to that a bit. Having said all of that, they too are immune to uh, kickbacks and self-referrals, which doesn't make any sense, because I can't refer a patient to myself for a procedure. And in 2015, while organized medicine was in Washington, D.C., and I remember some of the people in this very room, we were all in D.C., and the AMA, the American Medical Association, the AOA, the American Osteopathic Association, and all, all the other big hitters were like, you've got to repeal the failed Medicare payment formula. And my question was, what are you going to replace it with? And we went out of the frying pan, which never really happened because it was kicked down the road every year, into the fire of MACRA. And MACRA is basically Pokemon Go for physicians. That is to say, it turns Medicare reimbursement into a big data algorithm game. So again, you've seen this slide before also, the uh, so-called Affordable Care Act. Physicians are on the far left, small and uh, patients are on the far right, small, and the biggest thing on the map is the Secretary of Health and Human Services, and then there's dozens of other entities in between. I want to thank Dean Clancy, a policy wonk, who was with us uh, on that fateful day in um, 2015, uh, which helped uh, make up this graph and chart. And you remember the three original lies of Obamacare that President Obama said at least three dozen times in media, you can keep your doctor, you can keep your health insurance if you like it, and you'll save $2,500 per family. And when we talked in our, our last lecture about messaging, on message, on message, on message, on message, three total lies, three falsehoods, and now no one has done anything to really change it except uh, minor changes uh, by the president, which I think has been positive, but, uh, but not enough. Uh, the, uh, the uh, so-called Affordable Care Act, or Obamacare, arranged for vertical organization, and the ACA architects uh, working for o the Obama White House stated that increased vertical organization of providers and physician employment by hospitals was a feature, not a bug. 
and that is a huge problem. Independent physicians can practice independently for independent patients, as in independent physicians for patient independence or ip4pi.wordpress.com, which is a place where I've blogged for several years now. Um, why practices, why small practices are doomed, whether doctors like it or not. And in 2011, February, I got a copy of Managed Care, and I don't know why they sent it to me, just to give me agita and, uh, and anxiety and whatever. But if you look at the cover closely, it says, care coordination will improve as small practices disappear. And it has not been the case. Small practices are disappearing, getting absorbed in hospitals, but care is worsening. It's becoming more expensive and more difficult. We had all been grubered, for sure. What had the politicians done to everyone? Independent physicians shifted to hospital employed, which was a major issue. We were no longer the independent profession that, that we were. The playing field was slanted by ACA toward insurance companies and hospitals, which of course was likely uh, because of all the lobbying uh, that was done to, to produce it. And if you look at uh, the graphs and charts there, small practices were driven out and hospitals were acquir acquiring physician practices and physicians as employees. And, and as you know, it's been said many times, many different ways, he or she cannot understand what he or she is paid not to. And when you work for a hospital, you understand their reality. And that's all. After ACA, what did we find? Hospital employed physicians are more costly. Gee, that was genius, huh? Try to figure that one out. Didn't we learn this lesson already in the 1990s with HMOs? And there are several articles here with regard to that with regard to Medicare spending on hospital-based physicians versus independent physicians. Bigger bills from hospital-owned physician offices that, and, and procedure centers, for sure. Also, hospital-owned physicians refer to more expensive hospital-owned facilities. Again, uh, see rule number one, uh, the golden rule. He who has the gold makes the rules. And you notice bigger bills. Um, I can get a uh, colonoscopy at a private physician's office for about $850, including anesthesia, all things done. If they go to a hospital, there's a facility fee of several thousand dollars to add to that. So it might be $3,000 for the same procedure. Does Medicare pay it? Mostly. And also the referrals. Instead of being referred to private practices, they're being referred to hospital systems, and it should be against stark law, but again, they've been exempted. Hospitals are indeed the biggest cost in healthcare. That beloved hospital, it's driving up healthcare costs. This article was out just a, a few weeks ago by a Dr. Elizabeth Rosenthal in none other than the New York Times. Surprise, surprise. The American hospital, facility fees, the farce everyone pays for. Again, someone else that was uh, on this uh, very stage previously at a, at, a, at a past meeting, Marnie Jamison Carey, who is with the Association of Independent Doctors, or AID. Um, patients must know costs. It's hugely important for uh, patients to understand costs and to be able to have a share in those costs so they can make good decisions based on their own personal value systems. And uh, I published in U.S. News and World Report that patients must know costs and their hospital rankings should be based on costs as well. In fact, uh, my daughter was referred by her uh, pediatrician to uh, the Children's Hospital of uh, Philadelphia at one point. So we decided to, to get some x-rays in our area with a local practice. The local x-ray place charged us 128 bucks. The Blue Cross Blue Shield affiliate beat them down to $38. We paid the $38. The pediatrician wound up sending her to CHOP of the University of Pennsylvania anyway. Um, they decided they wanted to do their own x-ray, and I figured I was going to get hacked for a few hundred dollars, maybe $300. It was $40 to read the x-rays. What was the facility fee for three plain films of the spine? $1,100 for a $38 x-ray. That I, I would have paid, I would have paid a buck fifty for it. I would have paid that. However, um, I, I had to speak with the VP of the hospital system about that issue and why I wanted to pay him, but I wasn't going to be extorted. So as we know, hospital administrators and costs, we've all seen uh, the graphic that has a linear line about how doctors 
have in number have increased slightly, whereas administrators have gone up exponentially. And here are some articles on that. Did massive regulations and insurance lower costs? That was a question. Okay, no, indeed, indeed. And you can see in 1965, Medicare and Medicaid, you can see the HMO Act in 1972, and the ACA made things go off like wildfire in uh, 2010. So the hospitals have anti-competitive tactics. They run urgent care systems. And I remember um, one of the hospital systems says, we're going to build an urgent care in your town. They're there to help you. And I said, OK, how is that? And they said, well, they're going to be there when you're not there. And I said, well, I'm there 9 to 9 most of the days of the week. And I do a half a day on Saturday. So you're going to be there 9 PM to 9 AM most of the days of the week. No, we're not going to do that. Well, how are you helping me then? How are you helping exactly? So not helping, competition for sure. And the other thing is, is they put family practices in there as well. So well, if you don't have a doctor, you don't like your doctor, whatever, you can come see one of our doctors, we'll spin the big wheel. Maybe it won't even be a doctor. Could be a mid-level provider, but come on in and, and come sit down and uh, let's talk over some lunch. They're also for specialists, um, as I had talked to Dr. Held in the, in the past, you know, they, they play issues with operating room days and OR times, and they sort of outcompete you with little digs in that, um, uh, with staffing issues. They coerce private physicians and facilities into billing arrangements. There was a private, uh, large, well, I say large, probably medium practice of about 45 cardiologists in my area. They charged $800 for a nuclear stress test. When they got into a billing arrangement with the hospital, $6,000 bill for, and for that stress test. Unbelievable. Hospitals are, are part of ACOs so they can self-refer. They strong arm independence out with all of their technology, their expensive EHR, Cerner, Epic, eClinical works, which just get in everybody's way and you can't afford it anyway. They also own their own hospitalists now. So as an independent, you can't go into the hospital. So I pay them $200 a year for staff privileges for what? What? I even wrote an article about it, having said all of that. And the ER physicians don't always call you when your patient gets admitted. Who do they get admitted to? The hospitalists. Who does the work? God only knows. Ah, the good old days, nostalgia. No, not that I was bicycling. I'm still doing that. Um, having said all of that, this was morning rounds before office hours, December on 2011. I haven't been back to the hospital since. I, I, can't, uh, I can't take the time and the resources to do it, and I don't, I don't use their EHR. I have uh, different systems in my office that are incompatible. And again, why do hospitals compete with us when we built them in the first place? The American Hospital, um, from volunteer charity to tax-exempt patronage pit, that says kind of exactly what I need it to say in the, in the shortest uh, distance between two points. That's my straight line. There's also a copy of the uh, article inside your packet there. It's time for hospitals to post prices, compete on price and quality, cancel their cronyism with government, and pay their fair share of taxes like the rest of us. So here are some action points. I wrote them all down. Posted prices at healthcare sites, and the Trump administration has taken action on that, having uh, hospitals post their prices uh, January 1st in 2019. Some work needs to be done on that, but kudos for that. Site neutral payments, no facility fees on hospitals. They should get paid what everybody else gets paid or a percentage of their charges, and the patient should have to share in that. So the patient can decide, want to go to the big hospital and pay more, want to go to the small office, get better service and pay less. It's uh, fairly simple. We need to get uh, doctors unenrolled from insurance networks as well as Medicare and Medicaid. We talked about some of the risks and benefits of that. Expanding HSAs to cover all kinds of things, over-the-counter products, direct primary care, what have you, very important. No mandatory osteopathic certification or mandatory um, 
mock certification for MDs, um, for staff privileges or credentialing. It's, it's, it's a force, and it, and it really shouldn't have to be reckoned with, but we're reckoning with it with lawsuits at practicing physicians in America and the Association of American Physicians and Surgeons. And uh, kudos to both organizations. Fighting sham peer, re peer review and reporting to the NPDB, the National Practitioners Data Bank, as we heard earlier today. Once there's a report in there, it's almost impossible to get it changed or expunged. Action points two, get federal laws changed to allow physicians to own hospitals again. There was a moratorium in ACA to, uh, to eliminate that, so we need to get it changed. Repeal of a cert state certification of need laws, and uh, that was uh, spoken about earlier. Revoke hospital health systems tax exempt status. It's time for tax hospitals to pay their own taxes. Maybe then they won't pay their executives so much and they'll do more work in the community as they're supposed to. Revoke their nonprofit status for, and uh, get the Federal Trade Commission involved. I think that's an important use of our federal taxpayer dollars. Also, we need to repeal ACA. Unfortunately, it's one of those things that's gonna be around forever. It's every bit of it is bad. We need to give Medicaid back to the states, let each state divine their own solution for their own people, and we'll have 50 different experiments going on instead of one giant failed experiment, which is what we have now. We also have to resist and repeal the interstate medical licensure compact with the FSMB where there's gonna be one federal license. In fact, my thought is, is even beyond that, the chairman of that is going to go for one world license. So no matter where you're trained or what you do, that's what's going to happen. I mean, that's where it's all headed. And, and unfortunately, we've got to stop it before it uh, takes us off. So in closing, I'd like to quote my colleague that uh, brought us through the lunch hour, Dr. G. Key Smith, who, who sent me just a wonderful email when I had uh, contacted him uh, in previous years, actually. He said, the answer is to build a better mousetrap, make them inconsequential. The smartest thing I ever did was move on and just forget about them, meaning the insurers and the government, identify the leverage that they have and that they thought they held over me and eliminate it from my life. That is to say, insurance network participation, which we've spoken extensively about. Now they hate us for the ideas we promote, free markets. That's a possible position for them. I love hearing them declare that cheaper and better should be avoided. It's an interesting argument to make. So there's a bibliography page number one, bibliography page number two, and thank you all very much.